on Thursday of last week, uh, line 1700. And this is right after Hrothgar spins about 11 lines, 11 or 12 lines, to examine this um, sword hilt that Beowulf has brought back up from Grendel's Mere. He examines the sword hilt. We're told by the poet that the sword hilt has on it um, engraved, and we're not exactly sure what that means. That could mean that this is kind of some pictography that's on there, or it could mean that there is some kind of runic inscription that says this is what's happening. Um, that there was a flood that slew the ancient race of giants. And then it also had inscribed in runic letters who the sword was made for. The poet never tells us that information, never gives us a name. Okay. So Hrothgar looks at all that, and then he finally speaks. And he says a speech that's about 84 lines long. Okay. This speech is frequently referred to, or, or commonly called, one of two things. Either Hrothgar's homily or Hrothgar's sermon. Okay. Um, homily and sermon are essentially the same thing. Slight difference is that a sermon normally kind of explicates or explains what a biblical passage means. A homily doesn't have to do that. A homily can be based upon a biblical passage, but then it can talk about kind of moral application and that kind of thing. Okay, so I'm going to read the entire thing first, and then we're going to talk about it. We'll we'll probably have to go into Beowulf a little bit on um on Thursday. One may indeed say, if he acts in truth and right for the people, remembers all, the old guardian of his homeland, that this Earl, speaking about Beowulf, was born a better man. Better than whom? Better than the average person? Better than himself? Beowulf, my friend, your glory is exalted throughout the world, over every people. Okay? We've already been told by Hrothgar, stories of Beowulf's exploits and deeds and strength had reached him even before Beowulf arrived. So, you hold it all with patient care. That is, what does he hold with patient care? His glory. His fame, his reputation. Beowulf is not, contrary to what I put up on the board last week, Beowulf is not Donald Trump. Okay? Because does Donald Trump hold his quote-unquote glory with patient care? No. He wants everybody to know about it. And I'm not knocking Trump. I'm just using him as an example. Beowulf doesn't, okay? And, notice, you temper strength with wisdom. So what does it mean to temper something? You mix it. Tempered steel is steel that is an alloy. It's been heated up and cooled, and heated up and cooled, and heated up and cooled. Why? To make it stronger, okay? So Hrothgar says Beowulf tempers strength with wisdom. Is it enough just to have brute strength? No, it's not. Is it enough just to have wisdom? No, because wisdom without strength is powerless. Strength without wisdom is purposeless or directionless. Okay? It's just raw fury. So... To you I shall fulfill our friendship as we have said. You shall become a comfort, everlasting to your own people, and a help to heroes. Not so was Haramod. To the sons of Edgewallow, the honor shillings, he grew not for their delight, but for their destruction and the murder of Danish men. In the poem, Haramod is the exemplar, the type, the model of a bad king. Okay? So what does he mean? That he was not these things for his own people. Enraged, he cut down his table companions. 
In other words, he slew the men who sat around the dinner table with him. Not at all what a king is supposed to do. Comrades in arms, until he turned away alone from the pleasures of men, that famous prince. Though mighty God exalted him in the joys of strength and force, advanced him far over all men, yet in his heart he nursed a blood-ravenous breast horde. Notice, God exalted him in what joys? Strength and force. What did he lack? Wisdom. Okay. No rings did he give to the Danes for their honor. Remember last week I said, what is one of the marks of a good king? He distributes treasure. Okay. He endured joyless to suffer the pains of that strife, a long-lasting harm to his people. Learn from him. Understand virtue. Learn from Haramoth. What does he mean? How can Beowulf learn from Haramoth? Don't be like him. Okay? For your sake I'm telling this. In the wisdom of my winters. Keep in mind, Beowulf is younger than Hrothgar. We don't know how much younger. Okay? It is a wonder to say how mighty God, in his great spirit, allots wisdom, land, and lordship to mankind. He has control of everything. Notice. Wisdom, land, lordship. And then Hrothgar says, God rules everything, has control of everything. And then he tells a little story. At times, he permits the thoughts of a man in a mighty race to move into lights. That is, he gives or allows the thoughts of a man to delight him, to come up with something and he thinks, wow, that'd be really cool. Gives him to hold in his homeland the sweet joys of earth. In other words, he becomes a ruler of men, a stronghold of men. Grants him such power over his portion of the world, a great kingdom that he cannot himself imagine an end to it in his folly. God allows him to become such a mighty and powerful king that this king starts to think what? This kingdom will never... His kingdom will never die. His kingship will never end. Okay? And notice, Hrothgar says, in his folly, he thinks this. What's folly? Yeah. Foolishness. Yeah. It's foolishness. Why is that foolishness? What are the two inevitable things in life? Death and taxes. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, they even had taxes here. It's the tribute that Shield Sheving forces others to pay. It's the tribute that Hrothgar forces others to pay to help him build his hall. Okay. He dwells in plenty. In other words, he has everything going for him. Think Bill Gates. No, doesn't lack a thing. Okay. In no way plague him illness or old age. In other words... He's young, and he's strong. And I don't just mean physically strong. I mean he's healthy. He's full of life. Nor do evil thoughts darken his spirit. Nor any strife of sword hate shows itself. But all the world turns to his will. Okay? He doesn't have evil thoughts. I don't mean, you know, he's not plotting evil. It means... He doesn't see how anything bad can happen to him. Notice, nor any strife or sword hate. He doesn't have any enemies. Why not? Because all the world turns to his will. Everybody else fears this individual. He really is ruling his known world. He's in complete and total control. That's why he doesn't have any evil thoughts. He thinks, this is great. I've got the best life possible. He knows nothing worse. Okay? So, he's way up here. He's, you know, we use phrases today like, he's at the top of his game. Nothing can defeat this person. Until. 
at last his portion of pride within him grows and flourishes. When it says his portion of pride, it doesn't mean his sinful pride. It just means that bit of pride that every person has, right? Is this portion of pride that he's talking about bad? No. You do something well. You should take some glory in that. You should have some pride in that. You know, maybe it's an athletic event. Maybe it's an academic honor. Whatever, you get an award for, you know, best customer service or something like that at work. That's something you should feel proud about. That's the kind of pride he's talking about. But then what happens? It grows and flourishes. In other words, it kind of bursts beyond its natural boundaries. While the guardian sleeps the soul's shepherd. Notice the guardian, the soul's shepherd, is never defined. So what is it? What is the thing that shepherds, protects, guards the soul? <coughs> Louder? What's the thing that shepherds, protects, guides, guards the soul? That is, what is it that keeps the soul from getting in trouble? Or what is it that keeps you from getting in trouble? Or that should keep you from getting in trouble? You've all seen, you know, Bugs Bunny, Roadrunner kind of cartoons. Okay? And every, yes, louder. It's your conscience. Okay? Your conscience. It's that little thing inside that says, I really shouldn't do this. Or, it's that little thing inside that says, I really should do this. Okay? It's that sense of oughtness that every person has. Okay? And that falls asleep. Well, why does it fall asleep for this individual? What cares and concerns has he had? None. None. He doesn't fear anybody. He doesn't have any dark thoughts. Everything's been going his way, seemingly. He has no problems whatsoever in the world. Yeah, that's kind of when that voice within is going to fall asleep. Why? Because it doesn't, it's not active. It doesn't need to do any protecting. Because not, there are no problems. So, that sleep, the sleep of the conscience, is too sound. And what happens? Bound with cares, the slayer too close, who sinful and wicked shoots from his bow. Because the conscience is now asleep, the soul becomes bound with cares, notice. And the slayer, sinful and wicked, shoots from his bow. Notice your gloss tells you the slayer is sin or vice. The soul's guardian is reason, conscience, or prudence. All right? The slayer may not be sin or vice. The slayer may be the slayer that is referred to much earlier in the poem, the slayer of souls, Satan, the devil, the word Satan just means the adversary. So the adversary of the soul. Okay? And it may shoot from his bow. Okay? I think, and a few others do, not by any means, you know, the consensus of Anglo scholar, Anglo-Saxon scholars. I think this is a biblical allusion to Ephesians. I think it's Ephesians 5 or 6, okay? Where St. Paul says to put on the full armor of God. Why? Because you put on the breastplate of righteousness to do what? So that it can put out the fiery darts of the wicked one. Okay? That is, so it can stop the arrows of Satan. To do, from doing what? Not from hitting the chest, from plunging into the heart, which is the seat of the soul. Not the physical heart, 
but what New Testament writers refer to as the noose, the seat of the soul. Okay? So the slayer shoots from his bow, and what happens? Then he is struck in his heart, under his helmet. That's a poor translation. Okay? Helm there, previous page, just says helm. Helm doesn't mean necessarily helmet. Because where do we think a helmet goes? You wear that on your head. Helm just means protection. So a helmet is a protection you wear on your head. A breastplate is a protection you wear on your chest. Okay. Under his protection with a bitter dart. The word translated as bitter can also be translated fiery. See the possible allusion to Ephesians? He knows no defense. Why? Because the conscience is sawn logs. The conscience is sound asleep. And this, the individual who suffers this, therefore, can't repel it. The strange, dark demands of evil spirits. He doesn't mean demonic possession. What does he mean, the strange, dark demands of evil spirits? Those sinful promptings, those sinful desires, those sinful ideas. What he has long held seems too little. See? This is one of the sinful demands of an evil spirit. Prior to the fiery dirt, the individual was content with what he had. Now, it's not enough. I need more. What else? Angry and greedy, he gives no golden rings for vaunting boasts. So he no longer distributes treasure. Why? Because he's saying, mine. It's all mine. And his final destiny, he neglects and forgets. What's his final destiny? Death. Death. He forgets. Why? Because he thinks, I'm in the prime of my life, I'm on top of the world, nothing can stop me. And so he neglects his death. What does that mean? Are you supposed to think about death? Let's use, I'm going to use you guys for an example. Are you supposed to think about death when you're 20 or 22 or maybe 24? Yes. <laughs> That's what Hrothgar means. You are. Why? Because none of us know when it's going to happen. I mean, take what year was that? 2009, 2007, six, eight years ago, something like that, when that pissed off student at Virginia Tech went into school one day with a, I think it was an AR-57, an AK-47. And what did he do? He killed 32 students. Every one of those 32 students went to school that day thinking, I'll go home and I'll come back tomorrow. You go out, you get hit by a car. You're not planning on that, right? You don't get in the car in the morning and go, yeah, I think today I'm going to get hit by a car. That truck's going to... And just smear me across the road. You, you don't think like that. Okay? But what is he suggesting? You can get up in the morning and think, what if today's my last day? How do you live? Live to your fullest? Greet each person like it's the last day you're going to? How does that kind of change one's outlook, one's mentality? Does it make it morbid? No. It enriches. Okay? So, in his final destiny, he neglects and forgets, since God, ruler of glories... Okay, has given him a portion of honors. Notice, he forgets his final destiny. Why? Because God gave him a portion 
of honors. What does the poet mean by portion? It means, say this bottle represents all the honors in the world you can receive, and God does this. Gives them just a little bit. And that little bit he takes to be everything. That's right. All of it. I, the speaker, or the person being described, starts to think, I'm the greatest. I am the reason, reason that everything else is. And what happens? In the end, it finally comes about that the loaned life dwelling, the old English word there for loaned is lana, okay? which is an important term because every one of you probably, or many of you probably, have one of these things. This is what's called an ash. It's a combined A and E. Lean. Transitory. But it's also the word that Lisa correctly translates from which we get loan. Okay? But it's more than just loan here. It's this lean life. Okay? Life here the speaker, Hrothgar, is suggesting isn't rich. It isn't full. It isn't complete. Okay? But it's also loaned. Now, what's the problem with a loan? You got to pay it back. Okay? Just because you're given X, Y, or Z amount in a loan doesn't mean it's yours. The loan still actually does belong to somebody else. That's why you have a promissory note. And the promissory note essentially says, I promise to pay this back by such and such date. Okay? Guess what? The date in this loaned life is death. Okay? So, if in the end it finally comes about that the loaned life dwelling, the body, starts to decay and falls. Okay, now notice back at the beginning, we were told, line 1735, he dwells in plenty, and no way plague him illness or old age. This guy's young, he's in the peak of his power. But life happens, and he does start to age and decay and falls, fated to die. Why? Because everyone is fated to die. There's no escaping it. No matter how many vitamins, how many supplements you take, how much you work out, how much you practice plastic surgery, or you go into all the weird new agey, you know, I'm going to try cryogenics so that I can be frozen and brought back when they find a cure for X, Y, or Z disease. No. Fated to die. And then what happens? So he dies, having hoarded up all of his wealth at the end. Another follows him. A son, let's say. And what does the son do? He doles out all his riches without regret. So the father holds on to all the riches late in life. And what does the son do? He opens up the treasure chest and says, come and get it. The Earl's ancient treasure. The stuff for which the old guy essentially died holding on to it. He heeds no terror. That is, the young one, the one who distributes all the treasure, he's not afraid of the coming darkness, meaning death. Defend yourself from wickedness, dear Beowulf. Best of men. Best of men, like the guy I was just describing, who, keep in mind, is young, strong, a ruler, etc. Choose better. What does he mean, choose better? He kind of modifies that. Eternal counsel. Now, this is kind of interesting, because Beowulf, the poem...
is set in an entirely pagan Germanic society. Okay? The pagan Germanic peoples didn't really have an idea of eternity. Okay? Their mythology did not allow for dying and going off to a place of the blessed and being there forever, or dying and going off to a place of the damned forever. Their mythology included what was called, what is called, Ragnarok, okay? And there is a place called hell. So what's Ragnarok? Ragnarok has been variously translated as the end of the world, okay? And in some of the versions of this Germanic mythology, here's how Ragnarok works. It started by the death of one of the gods, a guy named Baldur, which we're going to talk about a little bit later too. Baldur is accidentally killed by another god, he is um, stabbed with mistletoe. That's according to the myth. The only way you can kill Baldur. Okay? Stabbed with mistletoe. And that kind of sets into motion a kind of a chain of events, a domino chain, if you want. Okay? And what happens at Ragnarok is you have two forces that go to battle. Those two forces are, let's say on the one side, comprised of the gods living humans, and dead humans. Okay? Let me rephrase that a little bit. Good living humans and good dead humans. The good dead humans are all the warriors who died in battle. And because they died in battle, they were carried off to a place called Valhalla. Valhalla literally is slain hall. The hall of the slain. Okay? If you're a warrior and you die, you get carried off to Valhalla, where you essentially party. It's just an Anglo-Saxon meat hall. A bunch of soldiers sitting around drinking, having fun, waiting for Ragnarok. Okay? So Ragnarok comes, and all the gods, and all the good living humans, and all the good dead slain warriors, mass on one side. And on the other side are the frost giants. Now, if you've seen any of either of the Thor movies, you get a little indication of some of this. The frost giants, the dwarves, the elves, the orcs, bad people. Okay? And including some kind of bad gods. Loki. Don't think Tom Hiddleston, because no matter what you think of Tom Hiddleston, he's not bad enough to be Loki, even in the portrayal in the films. Okay? So you have the forces of chaos, in other words. The frost giants, dwarves, elves, orcs, monsters, versus the forces of order. Okay? And in most versions of the myth, chaos wins. Darkness wins. The gods are destroyed. Thor is killed. Odin is killed. Their children are killed. The good humans are killed, and darkness wins. And that's it. End of story. Now, in some versions of the myth, out of the darkness, out of the destruction, Baldur is reborn. Okay? And humanity is recreated, kind of a, a new heaven and new earth. Some mythographers, people who study myths, actually say that Germanic mythology can, can and does ultimately trace its origin to the Christian myth. Because we don't have any examples of Germanic mythology prior to Christianity. Okay? And it's possibly, it gets developed out of telling of stories of Christian stories, you know, the God who hung on the cross becomes Odin who hung on a tree for nine days to do what? to acquire wisdom, you know, all kinds of stuff like this. So, there's no, no going off and living in the blessed realm for eternity in Germanic mythology. So, the, so Hrothgar says, 
Choose what? Eternal counsel. That is, counsel for eternity. Choose wisely for eternity. Care not for a pride. Great champion. Don't give in to pride, he's saying. The glory of your might is but a little while. You know, keep in mind, Beowulf's men are probably standing there and they're still holding Grendel's head by the hair. He's killed Grendel. He's killed Grendel's mother. He saved Hrothgar's kingdom. And Hrothgar's sitting here giving him a warning. All right? The glory of your might is but a little while. Too soon it will be the sickness of the sword. Will shatter your strength. Somebody's going to kill you. Or the grip of fire. Or you're going to get burned to death. Or the surging flood. You'll die in the water. Or the cut of a sword, or the flight of a spear, or a terrible old age. Notice which one comes last. <laughs> yeah. Because Hrothgar's old. He's almost implying, I should have died when somebody killed me. Instead, I waste away. Or the light of your eyes will fail and flicker out. In one fell swoop, death, a warrior, will overwhelm you. Okay? So notice that. Don't give in to pride. You're at the top of your game right now, Beowulf. Everybody sings your praise, knows your glory, etc. Don't believe your press, he's saying. Okay? Look at the next line and a half. Thus, a hundred half years, I held the ring Danes under the skies. What does the thus mean? I think he's saying, I was the man I was describing. I was the one who was given rule over men, a wide kingdom, great treasure, all kinds of glory. And I thought I would never die and I would never get old and I would never lose it. And kept them safe from war for many tribes throughout this Middle Earth, from spears and swords, so that I considered none under the expanse of heaven my enemy. Well, what did he say? 1735, he dwells in plenty, no way plague him, illness or old age, nor do evil thoughts darken his spirit, nor any strife or sword hate shows itself, but all the world turns to his will. Hrothgar saying, that was me. Look. And I think when he says look, he points to Grendel's head. Turnabout came in my own homeland. In other words, it didn't start on the borders. It didn't start in one of my tribute countries. No. Grief after gladness when Grindel became my invader, the ancient adversary. You could almost translate that. The ancient Satan. For that persecution, I bore perpetually the greatest heart cares. And notice, though, when did Grindel come? After he ruled for 50 years. Thanks be to the Creator, the Eternal Lord, that I've lived long enough to see that head stained with blood with my own eyes after all this strife. Why? Is he just thankful that Grindel's dead? Okay, he is thankful that Grindel is dead. But it's more than that. Why? 50 years of peace and prosperity, 12 years of hell and hardship. Okay? During the 50 years, what did he think? It's going to be like this forever. And then Grendel comes. And what does he think? It's going to be like this forever. And now change comes. What's Hrothgar starting to learn. Yeah. Nothing stays this way forever. 
Okay? Go to your seat. Enjoy the feast. Honored in battle. Between us shall be shared a great many treasures when morning comes. So, why does he deliver this homily to Beowulf? What's he doing? And what might the Anglo-Saxon poet be doing through Hrothgar to the hearers of the poem? Warning them of what? Okay. What else? The imminence of death. What else? Whatever your life is like at this point, it's not always going to stay that way. That is, you might be at the bottom of the barrel. How Hrothgar was after 12 years. But it's not going to stay that way. Similarly, you may be at the top of the mountain. But it's not going to stay that way. Life is, an ancient Greek philosopher named Heraclitus said, life is is flux. It's always changing. It's always turning. Okay? So what happens? Beowulf goes and sits down. Okay? They go to bed. The next morning, Beowulf is ready to leave. And so what does he do? He gives his sword to Unferth. Okay? And Hrothgar has a whole bunch more treasure brought in. And um, fit 26, Beowulf tells Hrothgar, we're ready to go home. You've treated us well. If ever I can do anything for you to earn more of your affection, I'll be ready at once. If I hear over the sea's expanse you need help, he says, I will bring you a thousand things. Heroes to help you. Helak, my king, even though he's young, he'll do what I say. Okay. Why does it say, though, he be young? Is he just saying he's young, he's, you know, rash? Or is Beowulf suggesting possibly that he's older than Helak? I think that's a possibility. Okay. If ever Hrothric, son of a prince, decides to come to the Gatish court, he will find many friends. You know, keep in mind the little diagram I drew the other day. Hrothric and Hrothman and Beowulf sitting between them in the one feast. Hrothgar, Hrothulf, Welthel. I think probably in this scene, Hrothric and Hrothman are sitting in front of their father again. Hrothulf's on the side, Welthel's over there. And Beowulf says... If the future king ever comes to the Gatish court, he'll find friends. And I think he's signaling to Hrothulf there, don't push your luck. I killed Grendel. I killed his mama. I can take you out. Okay? Hrothgar says, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> the wise Lord sent those words into your mouth. A shrewder speech from such a young man. You're strong in might, sound in mind, prudent in speech. Okay? And he says, and I kind of prophesy, if something happens to Hrethel's son, Helak, if he dies in battle, you will become king after him. Okay? So he gives Beowulf all kinds of treasure. And Beowulf and his men get in their boat. And they go away. I'm going to skip a bunch. They make their way to uh, Helak. And about line 1987. Helak asks, How'd your journey go, Beowulf? How did you fare when you suddenly resolved to seek a far-off strife? Notice, to seek a strife, to start a feud. He says, man, I was worried. I seethed with heart care and distress. Mistrusted the adventure. 
Wait a second. When Beowulf landed in Hrothgar's kingdom, Beowulf said, well, everybody at home, they encouraged me to go. Helek is now saying, I didn't want you to go, and I've been worried witless ever since. I say thanks to God that I can see you safe and sound. And Beowulf says, it's no mystery, Lord. What does he mean? Surely you've heard already about the stories of my killing Grendel and Grendel's mother. Okay. He says, I avenge them all. And then he tells a little story about Hrothgar's daughter, okay, which we didn't actually witness this in the poem. Beowulf is relating that this is something that happened. And he says, um, line 2024, she has promised young gold adorned to the gracious son of Froda. Okay. The ruler of the Shieldings has arranged this. What's he talking about? Freywaru, Hrothgar's daughter, is going to marry Ingeld, son of Froda, okay, of the Heathobards. Why? Because the Danes or Shildings or Shildings are in a feud with the Heathobards. So Freywaru is going to marry the son of the king of the Heathobards to try to bring peace between the two nations. Okay? And Beowulf says, here's what I think is going to happen. There may be a noble son of the Danes, received with honors, following after Freywaru along the floor. That is walking behind her. And this guy is wearing ancestral heirlooms. That is, he's wearing the armor and the weapons of a dead Hethelbard warrior. Well, why is this Danish guy wearing this stuff? Because his father won it from the dead Heathobard warrior. His father killed the dead Heathobard warrior in a previous battle. The father died, bequeathed those heirlooms to his son. And so now his son is wearing this stuff in the Heathobard kingdom. In the capital. Okay? And look what's going to happen. And then an old spear bearer, an old warrior, a guy who lived through that previous battle between the Danes and the Heathobards, starts to test, we're told, the metal of a young thane. In other words, he's testing his spirit. A young Heathobard warrior, the son of the dead guy. And this old guy's going to say, you see him? You see that corslet? That was your daddy's. You see that sword? That was your daddy's. You gotta let him do that. Get him. Why is he doing this? Well, to test his spirit. Can you, my friend, recognize that sword which your father bore into battle in his final adventure beneath the helmet? That dear iron when the Danes struck him, ruled the field of slaughter after the rout of heroes, when Withergild fell, those valiant shieldings. Now here some son or other of his slayer, some son or other of your father's murderer, is wearing your father's armor. What's he appealing to? This notion of feud. It's your duty to kill this man. Okay? It's your obligation to your dead father to exact vengeance. He urges and reminds him on every occasion until the time comes that Freyru is thane for his father's deeds sleeps bloodstained. Notice, not because of anything the kid did, the son did, for his father's deeds. And then what's going to happen? Where does that take us? It takes us back to the um, Finsburg episode. 
when Hildebrand and her cohort, you know, are now living with Finn and her brother and his army come to visit, and what happens? Open feud breaks out. And what's going to happen here? Beowulf's going to foretell. The Hildebrands are going to get wiped out. Freyru is going to go back and live with the Shilvings. No husband, no children. Okay, the same kind of thing will play out. Okay. So then Beowulf gets back to the main point. He tells him about his battles with Grendel and Grendel's mother. Tells him about the death of Honshu. Okay. And then he gives all the treasure to him. He says, I, I don't have many kinsmen left but you, so here you go. Okay. And Helak honors him. He gives him a bunch of land. So that Beowulf is the second largest landowner in all of the Gaidish kingdom. And we're told, line 2177 or so. So the son of Ejthal, that's Beowulf, showed himself brave, renowned for battles and noble deeds, pursued honor. And then the poet adds this. By no means slew drunken his hearth companions. He had no savage heart, but the great gift which God had given him, the greatest might of all mankind he held brave in battle. Why does the poet say he by no means, drunken, slew his hearth companions? What did Hrothgar say about Haramod in his little homily? He, in anger, did kill his hearth companions. Okay? So the poet's kind of saying, Beowulf isn't, isn't Haramod. And then the poet says, he had been long despised. As the sons of the Geats considered him no good, nor did the lord of the waiters wish to bestow many good things upon him on the mead benches. Why? Because they assumed that he was slothful, a cowardly nobleman. In other words, in his youth, what did the Geats widely think of Beowulf? What kind of person was he? What kind of person was he going to turn out to be? We use a term today. Slacker. He wasn't going to turn out to be anything. Okay? Notice what it said. They considered him no good. Okay? Maybe this gets back to what Unferth was talking about when he says, Are you the same Beowulf who did the swimming contest with Brecca? In other words, you kind of risked your lives on a foolhardy, stupid bet. What kind of idiot would do that? Okay. They thought he was slothful and cowardly. Reversal came to the glorious man for all his griefs. What were all his griefs? Everybody thinking he'd amount to nothing. Do you think this could explain this wide-held belief and assumption about him? That this could explain why Beowulf does the things he does in the story? I mean, think about this for a moment. When he arrives at the land of the Danes, and Unferth challenges him, what does Beowulf say? Not only does he accuse Unferth of being a kinslayer, but he also says some other things. He says that he slew a race of sea monsters. He slew an entire tribe of giants. Okay. Hrothgar then says, or Hrothgar said earlier, stories about him have reached me. So Beowulf has seemingly been going about his life doing what? Kind of like what Harry Potter does throughout the seven books. 
because of something that we're told in book one about Harry. When Harry puts, how many of you have read the Harry Potter novels? Okay. When Harry puts the sorting hat on, what does the sorting hat say about him? Okay, it says, you know, you could achieve greatness if you're in Slytherin. But what else does it say? Not a bad mind. A thirst to prove yourself. Hmm, that's interesting. Why does Harry have a thirst to prove himself? Well, what did Ron tell him? What did Hagrid tell him? You're great, Harry. Once you've been trained up a bit, you're going to be super. And what else? He's in every book of modern witchcraft, his, uh, wizard, witchcraft and wizardry history there is. And he doesn't know why. In other words, he feels like he has this great model that he has to live up to. And he doesn't even really know what it is. Beowulf, who's been thought to be nothing, wants to do what? Prove himself. I'm not nothing. I'm not a slacker. I'm not a coward. I'm not a weakling. And so he seemingly goes out looking for ways to prove himself. Okay? I'm going to go back for a second to what um, Helex said. How did you fare, beloved Beowulf, in your journey when you suddenly resolved to seek a fire of strife? Suddenly. What does that imply? So you just, that just got up and did it. That's right. It was rash. It was impulsive. Okay. Did you better at all the well-known wolf, Hrothgar? For that I seethed with heart care and distress. Mistrusted the adventure of my beloved man. Why? Did he think Beowulf can't do it? Long I implore that you not seek that slaughter spirit at all. Okay. The protector of earls, battle proud king, ordered the heirloom of Hrethel, that is, the sword of himself. Helak orders this treasure to be brought in, gives it to Beowulf. And then what, we're, what are we told? Then it came to pass, amid the crash of battle in later days, after Elak lay dead, and for harder the swords of battle held deadly slaughter, blah, 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 that what? The kingdom came into Beowulf's hands. He held it well for 50 winters. Okay. That starts at line 2200. Beowulf has ruled for 50 winters. He was then a wise king, 2209. Nine lines. The poet goes from Beowulf just returning to, he's now been ruling for 50 years. Okay. And he held it well, we're told. For 50 winters, he was then a wise king, old guardian of his homeland. And what happens? The dragon comes. Notice the paradigm. Grindel's mother, what? Rules for 50 years. Beowulf enters her kingdom. She's killed. Hrothgar rules for 50 years. Grindel enters his kingdom. Hrothgar's not killed, but Grindel then rules for 12 years. 50 years, Beowulf rules his kingdom. The dragon comes. Okay? And we're told, some guy found his way into the dragon's barrow, grabbed a cup, and left. And what did he do with it? He went and he took it away to buy his freedom. But he sees all kinds of treasure in this barrow. And so the poet kind of thinks, I need to describe how this treasure got there. And he sings what is called the Lay of the Last Survivor. Okay? The Lay of the Last Survivor. A single person from a previous tribe, okay, 
The rest of the tribe has gone off, probably to do battle. He's the only one left behind. And he sees an empty barrow, an open burial mound. And what does he do? He puts all the treasure of that tribe into the mound. Hold now, O thou earth, for heroes cannot, the wealth of men. For heroes cannot. Why can't they? Because they're all dead. Okay? He's the last one surviving of his people. Lo, from you long ago, those good ones first obtained it. What does he mean? From you, O earth, long ago, those good ones, the heroes, first obtained the treasure. Well, where do silver and gold and jewels and gems come from? The ground. So all this wealth was dug up out of the ground, and he's saying, hold it again. Why? Death and war and awful deadly harm have swept away all of my people who have passed from life and left the joyful hall. Now have I none to bear the sword or burnish my cup, the precious vessel. All that host has fled. He's starting to get to a theme. What has all that precious gold, those bright vessels, those bright cups, what good have they done for those heroes? Now must the hardened helm of hammered gold be stripped of all its trim. The stewards sleep who should have tended to this battle mask. So too this warrior's coat which waited once the bite of iron over the crack of boards, molders like its owner. The hero, the warrior, rots in his grave, just as this treasure will. The coat of mail cannot travel widely with the war chief beside the heroes. Harp joy have I none. He means I don't hear the harp being played. No happy song. Nor does the well-schooled hawk soar high throughout the hall, nor the swift horse. Why? Savage butchery has sent forth many of the race of men. Is the poet celebrating warfare? Is the poet celebrating death in battle? No, he's not. So, grieving, he mourned his sorrow alone after all. Unhappy sped both days and nights until the flood of death broke upon his heart. We're not told how long this guy lived. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't kill himself. Why? Suicide is not an option in Germanic society. You live. You take what fate has to throw at you. Until what? Until one dawn, he dies. And an old beast of the dawn found that shining hoard standing open. A dragon. Dragon finds the open hoard of treasure. Well, what do dragons do? In Germanic literature, they sit on treasure. That's, that's all they do. Their only purpose for existing is to find a hoard of treasure, do like a dog when it's getting ready for bed, Walk around it three or four times, get comfortable, lay down, and sleep. That's all they do. Okay? And what happens? The dragon sleeps there for 300 years. Until this guy comes and steals a cup. So the treasure's been in the ground for 300 years. No. We're going to find out later the treasure's been in the ground for a thousand years. Okay? The guy dies, and the treasure lies there for 700 years. And then the dragon comes. Okay? So the guy comes, steals the cup, and that's what is meant by the hoard was looted, line 2283. One Peace was taken. Okay. Dragons are very jealous of their hordes. One piece was taken. And the dragon 
stirs, and we're told strife is renewed. And what does the dragon do? He comes out of the burial mound, and he starts to torch the countryside. And he doesn't do it in a haphazard fashion. If the burial mound's like this, the dragon doesn't come out and, and you know, do that. No, he comes out and does this. Why? He's scorching everything. And then what does he do? He goes back into his mound. He walks around it two or three times. He lays back down. And he goes to sleep. That is the dragon's revenge. He burns the countryside. Just destroys everything and goes to sleep? Yep. Or destroys what he can. And goes back to sleep. Does the dragon know whether or not he got the guy who stole his cup? No, he doesn't. Doesn't matter. You know. His vengeance is to destroy what's around and go back to sleep. And sleep for possibly another 300 years till some other damn fool comes in and steals a cup. Okay? So that's what fit 38, 33 is about. The dragon came out, spewed flames. Word is brought to Beowulf that his own home is burned. And we're told by 2327, to the good man, that was painful in spirit. Okay? The greatest of sorrows. The wise one, Beowulf, believed that he had bitterly offended the ruler of all, the eternal Lord, against the old law. Notice the difference in how Beowulf responds to the dragon's coming and how Hrothgar responded to Grendel's coming. Hrothgar sits down and just mourns. Why me? Beowulf sits down and thinks, what have I done to offend you, God? Beowulf thinks he is personally responsible, that he has done something against the old law. We don't know what that old law is. Bear in mind, Beowulf is not a Christian. He knows nothing of Christianity. All he knows of God is this kind of monotheistic God. That's it. He doesn't have a name for God. He doesn't know anything of the Old Testament. It's just the ruling power, so to speak. Okay? And his breast within groaned with dark thoughts. That was not his custom. This is unlike Beowulf, we're told. The dark thoughts? He's done something wrong. So what does he do? Is he going to sit and mourn and wait for a hero to come take care of his problem? No. No, he has a shield made. A metal shield. Why metal? Yeah, it won't burn. Okay? And the poet then kind of elides into previous battle against Grindel, and then line 2354, it was not the least of hand-to-hand -hand combats when Helak was slain. We get the second of those Frisian raid digressions, okay? Why are we being told this thing about this Frisian raid? Because this is another one of Beowulf's great martial military exploits. He was off on that Frisian raid with Helak when Helak died. Beowulf didn't die. Beowulf was the only one that survived. And we're told... Beowulf escaped from there, 2359 or so, through his own strength, took a long swim. Okay? That's what's called litotes. L-I-T-O-T-E-S. Litotes is understatement. How long a swim? Several hundred miles. This isn't, you know, Diana and I had going from the tip of Cuba to the very southernmost point of the United States. Okay? This is several hundred miles in the Baltic Ocean. 
which is generally about 44 degrees, okay? And so took a really long swim and had in his arms the battle armor of 30 men. So he swam with the armor of 30 men in his arms. I don't know if that means he's carrying it like this and he's just kicking or if he's carrying it with one arm and he's kind of dog paddling with the other. Okay. Few came back from that brave soldier to seek their homes. That's more Lytotis. Again, Lytotis is understatement. So how many is few? Zero <laughs> came back. The son of Edgethal crossed the vast sea, wretched, solitary, returned to his people. The verb for crossed, line 2367 on the facing page translation, over swam. He swam over. I would have translated that. The son of Edgethal swam over the vast sea. Okay. And what happens? Well, he gets back. He has to relate the news to Hig, the queen. Your husband's dead. She offers the kingship to him. He says no. Why? Because someone is in line to the throne. Her son, Hardred. So Beowulf says, make him king. I'll just stand behind him and flex. So nobody will bother him. Okay? And what happens? We get a longer digression. We're told about these two exiles who come. They seek refuge. Okay? Trying to... Decide if I should spend time on this or not. Um, real quickly. These two guys come seeking refuge. Are the sons of Ultra. Who in the hell is Ultra, you ask? Okay. These are Swedes. You have Anya Dao. Anya Dao has two sons. Othra and Onola. Othra has two sons. Aemon <coughs> and Aedios. Onola doesn't have a son. We're going to read later about how Anya Dao gets killed. So Othra should become king. Problem is, apparently, Onola kills his brother to become king. Kinslaying, very bad thing to do. So these two flee and they go over to the land of the Geats, okay, where Hardred is now king. Hardred gives them protection, kind of like Hrothgar did to Beowulf's father. Hardred gives them protection. Onola invades because he's after these two because they are Dangerous to his throne. Okay. Anwen is going to be killed, but not by Onola, by a man who works for him. And I'm jumping ahead a bit in the story. This is why it's all important. Though. This guy, Weston, is going to be the one to actually kill Anwen. He's going to take Anwen's armor, weapons, etc. Give them to Onola, because that's what a thane does. He takes the spoils of war, gives it to his lord. And if his lord's a good lord, the lord will essentially distribute it back. Onola is going to give Anmon's armor and weaponry back to Weston. Do you see a parallel with anything we've already seen? The little story Beowulf told about Freywaru and Froda. Okay? And the Danish guy wearing the Helobardish armor. Okay? Weston's going to die. He's going to give all that armor to his son, Wilof. We're now at almost the end of the poem for a moment. Okay? Because when they come, okay, Hardred's going to be killed by Onola, which means Beowulf becomes king. And this is going to be a problematic point because the poem is going to say that Onola let Beowulf have the throne. That is, he allowed him. He gave him permission to. Okay, what should Beowulf do? 
or what should Beowulf have done that wouldn't allow Onla to give him the throne? He should kill him, right? Why? Because he killed his lord. Onla killed Beowulf's king. His duty is to kill the guy who kills his king. But he doesn't. We're going to be told later on he helps Onla die. Okay? So, he helps Eadils, in fact, get revenge on Onla. So, once that happens, Onla is out of the picture. Eadils becomes king of the Swedes. Okay? End of the poem. Beowulf dies, because he's going to fight the dragon, who becomes king. Wheelof does. See the problem? What is Wheelof's relation to Eadils? Bingo. Wheelof's father killed Eadils' brother. The feud erupts. Because Eadils now has a reason to attack the Geats. Why? Because his father's slayer's son is now king of the Geats. And what does Eadils not have to worry about? The big guy. Because the big guy's dead. All right? That's more than you needed to know at that point. But I needed to get, get it all covered. So, what happens? That's why it says, um, the wretched exiles, blah, 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 on a lay, uh, once Hardwood lay dead, and line 2389, let Beowulf hold the high throne and rule the Geats. That was a good king. The, that, it's not Beowulf. That's Onula, the poet is saying. Okay? In later days, he, that is Beowulf, did not forget that prince's fall, Hardred's, and he befriended Aedils, okay, and he helped Aedils become king. So that would make you kind of think, well, then Aedils shouldn't have anything against the gates because of Beowulf. No, it's he didn't have anything against Beowulf. Okay? And so the son of Edgethal survived. The reason the poet mentions all that is to just say, Beowulf survived through many slaughters and difficulties. So they make their way to where the dragon is. They see the barrow, they see the entrance to the barrow, and Beowulf sits down. Why? Because he's probably really old. He's definitely at least 80. And he's possibly at least 110 or so. Okay? He sits down, he wishes good health to his friends the men who have come with him, because not all of his warriors came with him. Interesting little tidbit here. Beowulf only takes, to fight the dragon, 13 warriors. It's actually 12 warriors and a thief. Okay, So there's 13 plus Beowulf. But there is a larger number kind of waiting behind on the hillside behind that. And then all the Geats kind of are waiting even further back. So all of them make the way partially to where the dragon is. Some stay back. A smaller group goes even farther. Some stay back. And then Beowulf and 13 men make their way to the dragon. So once they get here, because the thief has to show them how to get there, the thief bugs out. So it's Beowulf and his 12 men. Should see a parallel there with something. Okay? So, what does he do? He sits down. I remember when I was a boy. And he starts telling them stories about when he was young. Okay? And the particular story he tells here is the story of Haribald and Hathkin. Okay. Two sons of Hrevel, Beowulf's grandfather. So why is this important? We have 
Rebel in the gates. Oh. Harold has been Elak and unnamed daughter. Okay. Harold and Hathkin. Beowulf tells this story. Hathkin accidentally kills Harold. Okay. I mentioned earlier Baldur, the god, whose brother among the gods was a god named Hother. Bald, okay, have. Almost everybody thinks that this is an allusion to the Germanic myth of Ragnarok. Hathkin accidentally kills his older brother. So, what does he have to do? He's got to get vengeance. But he can't. He can't demand Hathkin pay Weirgild, because what would this be doing? It'd be like, you have a brother, you kill your brother, and your father says, pay up, and then writes you the check for you to give back to him. It's meaningless. Okay? Similarly, he can't say, I'm going to kill you because you killed my son. Because to do that, he has to kill his own son. So the whole Germanic system just implodes. This ideology of revenge and weirguild, what doesn't work? It just falls under by its weight. So Beowulf tells this story of essentially Revel dying of a broken heart. Why? Because he can't do anything after Harold dies. So he like becomes king, right? So he like becomes king. Um, and what happens? Line 24, 75. Until the sons of Anya thou were bold and wore like one of no peace over the hill, but surrounded the hill of sorrows. In other words, Anya thou's sons attack the Geats. Okay? War breaks out. And there's a reason for that. Because Hathkin, the one who's now in charge of the Geats, has done what? He's kidnapped Anyanthal's wife. We're told that he deprives her of her gold. Now, that may be a metaphor, for he raped her. Or it might be literal that he took all her gold and kept her too. So her sons attack. Hathkin dies. Helak becomes king. Okay? I'm skipping a lot here. Um, and about line 2500, we have the third reference to the Frisian raid. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. So pick up with line 2510. Beowulf says, I've survived many battles in my youth. I will yet an old folk guardian seek out a feud and do a glorious deed. If only that evildoer will come out to me from his earth hall. Why does he say, if only that evildoer, he sounds like George Bush, if only that evildoer. Um, why does he say, if that, only that evildoer will come out from the earth hall? What's the dragon doing? Mm -hmm. Dragon's been gone back to sleep. What's the, you know, the motto of Hogwarts? Anybody know? Never tickle a sleeping dragon. Why not? It'll wake up. What is Beowulf doing? He's going to awaken a dragon that has gone back to sleep. Why is he going to awaken a dragon that has gone back to sleep? Okay, to kill it, ostensibly, why else? Yeah, yeah, it's going to make him mad. Is this an element of pride? Well, it's not necessarily going to kill in cold blood because the dragon's going to wake up. So then it's going to be, you know, 
Killing it yeah, he doesn't go in and stab it, because notice, he's not going in. The dragon has to come out. Okay. Beowulf is saying he has a feud with the dragon, because what did the dragon do? The dragon destroyed Beowulf's home. Okay. But the dragon's gone back to sleep. Later on, towards the very end of the poem, we're going to hear um, Wheelof say... We tried to persuade him not to go. We tried to persuade him, let sleeping dragons sleep. But Beowulf wouldn't listen. Why not? How should Beowulf die? Should he die of old age? Should he just die lying in his cot, wasting away? The man who slew Grindel and Grindel's mother and a tribe of Giants and nine sea monsters? No, he shouldn't die weak and an invalid. He should die, if you're familiar with the film, like Butch and Sundance, going out in a blaze of glory. How much better of a monster to kill than a dragon? Remember what Beowulf was compared to by the riders coming back from Grendel's Mere? After he slew Grindel, but before he fought Grindel's mother, they compared him to Sigamund, the greatest hero in Germanic mythology, a dragon killer. Okay? So this is the poet kind of evening that balance. He's going to equate Beowulf with Sigamund. Okay? So he says, but this is my battle, guys. Notice how over here, you know, we broke down. All the Gaetish people, and then a group, and then a smaller group, and then lastly, it's Beowulf. He picks his choicest men to come with him, but they're like to watch. Because he's going to fight the dragon by himself. Why? What does he say? This is my glory. Okay? This is my battle. It's not, it's not any of yours. So, he stands up, and I know we're out of time. He stands up, he goes to the mouth of the cave, and what does he do? He yells something. We don't know what, but we're told that the dragon recognizes the voice of man. And it's probably Beowulf yells something offensive. You dirty, rotten son of a slimy worm. You know, however you yell something, that offends a dragon. And the dragon comes out all hot with deadly flames. Okay? We'll pick up around... 2550 or so on Thursday. Go ahead and read, if you haven't already, um, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Yeah. Because we'll do the rest of this probably fairly quickly within 15, 20 minutes.